Konnichiwa. This is the Shogunstein with a review of the new biography of the life of the man who Chuck Norris lost to on purpose, even though he really could have beat him in the way of the dragon. The uh, Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Polly. This is an excellent book. Can't recommend this high enough. Wonderful, wonderful biography of the, the man who uh, Chuck Norris lost to on, on purpose. So many things in this book to, to talk about. In general, what I just want to say is this. A good biography is, this is going to sound cliche, but a good biography is, is a biography where you, you learn things you didn't know before about a person that you're reading about. And I'll just give you an example. I recently read a biography of my favorite band, The Del Mitri Story. These are such perfect days. I read it twice, so I don't want to bash it too much. Del Mitri is my favorite band in the world. I love them. They could do no wrong. And when I was done reading this book, that's exactly what the book said. They're the greatest band in the world and they can do no wrong. Which is exactly what I believe. If I wrote a book on Delamitri, that's what it would have said. But that said, I really didn't learn anything new. Or not that many things new. Great book. Told me what I wanted to hear, which is Delamitri is great. The Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Polly, challenged a lot of what I thought I knew about, about Bruce Lee. And Linda Lee, too. And that, let me also just briefly state that. Linda Lee is uh, an amazing woman. And, and when you read about her in this book, I mean, the things that, that the challenges that she went through, whether it be um, being involved in an interracial marriage before it was, was common like it is today. You know, she was disowned by much of her family when she married Bruce Lee. Um, Bruce Lee's family, a lot of them didn't like her. She also had to uh, live in a, you know, they struggled, you know, for a lot of times when Bruce Lee was trying to open up his martial arts schools or break into acting, they didn't have a lot of money. She stood by him through that period. She stood by him when they were going back and forth between Hollywood and Hong Kong. That's certainly a, a clash of different cultures. And, you know, tragically, she had to go through the loss of uh, not only Bruce Lee at a very young age, but on the, the set of The Crow, her son Brandon Lee uh, being killed accidentally. And then at the end of the story, you know, she had the, the business sense to learn how to, uh, you know, do like what the Elvis estate and the Marilyn Monroe estate in terms of kind of uh, copywriting um, Bruce Lee, the way Marilyn Monroe and Elvis are, and, and making, you know, his merch, you know, profitable and keeping his memory a alive. So her story is, to me, after reading this book, as remarkable as, as Bruce. She went through a heck of a lot, and, and she stood by him even when, when times were, were really bad, and she went through a lot of bad stuff. Bruce Lee... Um, Again, this book challenged a lot of what I knew about Bruce Lee. I always knew the part about Bruce Lee having those struggles in, in television in Hollywood because he was Asian. What I didn't know was, was beforehand that he had been a successful child actor and a successful competitive cha-cha dancer in Hong Kong. So certainly when he came to the States, he struggled, but I was unaware of that his family was fairly successful in Hong Kong and that he had an acting career prior to being in the, the Kung Fu movies. I also didn't know that Bruce Lee was, was mixed. I didn't know that on his mother's side, the mother uh, came from a mixed background and on, on the white side of the mother's family, that uh, they're Jewish. So I didn't know that Bruce Lee was one of us, one of us, one of us, and that on the next uh, version of the Adam Sandler song, we're, we're going to put Bruce Lee on there. Um, I also did not know a lot about uh, the whole silent flute, this, this screenplay that they had been working on in Hollywood for, a, for quite a while between Bruce Lee, Sterling Siflint, Siflint and uh, even James Coburn, the, the actor. And uh, they, they were going to, this is prior to, you know, Enter the Dragon and just the, the struggles of trying to get this film made. And it was never made while Bruce Lee was alive. Later, it was going to be made into a, a different movie with, ironically, David Carradine in it. This book uh, did a really great job of just showing how 
Bruce Lee networked himself in Hollywood and how that affected him getting on shows like The Green Hornet, but he was supposed to be in a show before The Green Hornet. It was sort of a Charlie Chan sequel that uh, never got made. And there was a lot of things that were kind of meant for Bruce Lee, but they just were not ready for for an Asian actor on uh, TV. So, uh, you know, all those struggles of, of breaking into the industry. And I'm sure if you read a, a book about George Takai, there'd be some similar uh, stories there as well. George Takai, whether you like his politics or not, was also very groundbreaking as, as an Asian American actor. Speaking of the term Asian American, that's another thing that a lot of people might not know before they read this book. Bruce Lee's parents were uh, on tour with uh, a Hong Kong uh, sort of fundraiser, as I think it was right before World War II, to, or maybe during World War II, where they came to the States to try to raise money. And Bruce Lee was born in California. He was an American citizen. You might want to use the term anchor baby. Uh, some people use that term, but he's, uh, you know, we have this immigration debate about, you know, what the 14th Amendment says or doesn't say. And Bruce Lee was someone whose parents were not from the United States, but they gave birth to him here. So he was he was an American. And, you know, some people, they watch those, you know, those Hong Kong movies, you know, The Big Boss and, and Fists of Fury. And with the poor dubbing, and they they assume that he was just from Hong Kong or that he's Chinese, but he was actually born here. He spoke perfect English, and some people might be surprised by that part of the the story. And then the you know the Hong Kong. Not only do you learn about the television industry here and trying to break in, but you're also going to learn about the Hong Kong film industry and with the the Shaw brothers, and then Raymond Chow, and then you know again the the, the stories behind uh, the Big Boss and uh, Fists of Fury and then Way of the, the Dragon. And then, you know, also very interesting to me was uh, some of the things that Bruce Lee turned down. You know, as he was struggling to break into the business in this country, he was offered stereotypical parts and he refused to do it. He was offered parts in Westerns where he could would play like a, a coolie or we would have to lay that long braid, the cue that showed subservience when the China was when China was occupied by the Manchurians and the Manchurians made the Chinese men wear those long cues, those long braids, as a sign that they weren't equal to the Manchurians. Bruce Lee refused to take parts where he would have had to have done that. He didn't want to be, you know, you know, and he wanted to be a lead actor. He wanted to show the the beauty of Chinese culture. He didn't want to be in these stereotypical parts. So you're going to get the, that part of the book and just how some of the networking that he had done, you know, with people like James Colburn, Steve McQueen, uh, the hairdresser. Uh, I, I can't think of the guy. The guy who was killed during the uh, when the Manson family. Uh, attacked, um, you know, Sharon Tate, but there was a famous hairdresser who had a lot of Hollywood connections. Bruce Lee was friends with him. And then, you know, some of his celebrity student, another celebrity student was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And then that um, ties into the to the um, game of death. And you learn the story about that, how Bruce Lee shot the last 20 minutes of it but didn't have a movie before he died. He had that great fight with him and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but he didn't have a, a movie prior to that. And then, of course, the, the tragic death right around the time Enter the Dragon came out, his big American movie, which, which made him a huge star after he, he died. This book is getting a lot of publicity for the two chapters on Bruce Lee's death and the investigation. According to, to this author, Matthew Polly, Bruce Lee died from heat exhaustion. He had nearly died a couple months before he, from heat exhaustion, but uh, was revived. And then the same thing happened in the second time he wasn't revived. Throughout the book, the author talks about Bruce Lee and people uh, around him always noticing that he seemed to overheat and was always you know, dripping in sweat and didn't handle, you know, always seemed overheated. And uh, right before he died, because Bruce Lee didn't like how he was looked on film being all sweaty, he had the sweat glands removed from his underarms, which made it even more difficult for him to cool down. And then the crazy part of the story is that since he died, um, 
not with Linda, but with uh, in his girlfriend's apartment, and they had been smoking weed, and you know they were having an affair. There was a cover up in Hong Kong as to where he died and and what he was doing. So the the story was, you know, that I had always heard was that he had an allergic reaction to uh, aspirin. That you know they were reading scripts, and that he had a headache, and he took the medicine, and he. He died from the reaction to that medicine. And then, you know, the book does a good job talking about how they, they moved the body to different hospitals so that he'd be pronounced dead somewhere else and not at the girlfriend's apartment. So if it weren't so tragic, it's almost comical, you know, the, the, the cover-up. But it is very tragic because he was very young and he'd finally got that fame that he deserved through a lot of hard work. When I say deserved... Obviously very talented, and he worked hard. Nothing was handed to him. Once he came to the States, he had to work for everything that he got. And that's something that comes out very strongly in this book, that he was a guy who was nonstop energy, and he, despite all kinds of discrimination and uh, things not going his way, he constantly and constantly kept at it. He never gave up, and eventually... He did get Enter the Dragon, and, and then he was able to make substantial changes to that movie to make it into the good movie that, that it is. And I just, you know, right before I did this review, I rewatched Enter the Dragon, and minus a couple of, you know, very 70 moments in the film, the film is still awesome. I watched it the other night on Amazon Prime, and it's as entertaining now as it was when it, when it came out. Matthew Polly, the author, uh, wrote an excellent book that I read a few years ago called American Shaolin. There was a time in my life where I used to read all the travel narratives, you know, any of those books, you know, Iron and Silk, American Shaolin, um, uh, River Town. I used to read all the books about, you know, like white guy goes to China and lives there for, for a year. I read all those books and uh, Iron and Silk is one of my favorites, but American Shaolin was very good. Matthew Polly is a very good writer. He has a martial arts background and he does a great job talking about not just when he describes, for instance, the fight where Chuck Norris purposely lost or the fight with uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You know, he knows, he does, the descriptions are very vivid and very accurate. It's very good theater of the mind because the author has um, martial arts background. The philosophy, Bruce Lee, you know, constantly, you know, with his sort of Taoist philosophy with the Jeet Kune Do and uh, basically, you know, almost like a, a forefather of modern-day MMA, and the author does a great job explaining Bruce Lee's uh, philosophy, way more than just that clip we've all seen, like, be water, my, my friend. Only problem I have with this book is um, the author unnecessarily threw in a, a cheap political personal shot at Chuck Norris. Throughout the book, Chuck Norris, um, it's clear that he and Bruce Lee were very good friends and very supportive of each other. They helped each other. Um, they, you know, both be better martial artists and helped their, their film careers out. They had an excellent friendship. And the author felt for some reason to throw in a, a cheap political shot, which just didn't go with the rest of the book. So, and again, I, I knew the author as, as, as a martial artist and having read his, his book, American Shaolin. But when I went to his Twitter feed, I noticed there was a lot of like uh, left-wing politics on the author's Twitter feed. So it's obvious that he politically, at least in my opinion, that is in my opinion, the author politically doesn't like Chuck Norris and felt the need to throw in a uh, political shot at Chuck Norris that really didn't go with the rest of the tone of the book and was very negative in a book where their relationship between Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris are very positive. But that's one sentence of a book that I have a criticism with. The rest of the, other than that one sentence, wonderful book. I, I strongly encourage you to read this book. If you like Bruce Lee, you like Hong Kong films, you're interested in Kung Fu, you're interested in just um, Chinese culture, Chinese uh, American you know, cultural, you know, diffusion. I just want to read a good book. You want to read a motivational book. Maybe you want to read a book that challenges, maybe you saw the movie Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, like I did, and you thought you knew all this stuff about Bruce Lee, and you find out what's true or not. Bottom line, this is a wonderful biography, 
And uh, I, I can't recommend it enough. I just with the author that hadn't thrown that line in about Chuck Norris. But if you want a really good book, Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Polly, uh, highly recommend. Show Gustine out.